Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to day three of Innovation Stories. Thank you for your patience here from the National Press Club. The Innovation Stories are a series of three unique innovation presentations. I'm Alice Nemrein, the director of the VHA Innovators Network. And Innovation Stories day three features innovator experiences, which frontline employees participating in the Innovators Network Sparkseed Spread program will talk about their journey from employee to employee innovator. And innovation demos will feature a selection of last year's Breaking Boundaries Collaboration Challenge winners and Innovation Innovators Network Greenhouse Initiative collaborative partners. They will tell you about the progress of their collaborations and how VA employees work with industry. And then finally, the innovation exhibitions are Office of Healthcare Information and Learning and National Centers for Innovation to Impact staff to update you on the status of their initiatives and programs. Enjoy day three. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Matt Knight. I am the programming curator for the VHA Innovators Network, and I am very excited to be with you here today hosting our final day of innovation stories, experiences, and demos. You're going to hear from a lot of great participants today, hear a lot of great stories, and we hope this is a great way to wrap up what's been an awesome week here at IEX. First up, we have Georgiana Hogan, who's going to tell us about her program, Eat at Home, Evaluation and Treatment of Homebound Veterans with Cardiovascular Conditions Using Innovative Technology. Georgiana, are you with us today? I am. Thank you for having me on. Awesome. I'm so excited to hear your story. Good afternoon. My name is Georgie Hogan, and I'm a nurse practitioner with home-based primary care. And do you know what keeps me up at night? Unsafe clinical health care decisions that could hurt my patients. Okay, so I have this patient with Alzheimer's disease. And when you enter his home, there are locks on everything to keep him from wandering into the street. He's been waking his wife more and more. And when he wakes her, he can't communicate his needs. So he's getting agitated, she's getting agitated. He's not sleeping and she's not sleeping. So here we have a house with two delusional people and a crisis is getting ready to happen. She calls me and I prescribe two medications that should keep them out of the hospital. However, they could also cause QT prolongation, fancy words for bad heart stuff. The next morning I get a call and I find out he's in the hospital. What, what could I have done differently? It is so frustrating to know that we have technology, like an Apple Watch, athletic watch, that could have given me that data and I could have made a huge difference. He wouldn't be in that hospital. So I enrolled in the VHA Innovators Network and was accepted as a Spark investee. I'm gonna make a difference. What can we do? Let's, let's bring on some change. Are we bringing in seizure watches? Can we biopsy skin in the field, portable x-ray anybody? I am so excited, let's do this. Okay, yes, I was an annoying millennial. We all know how this goes. I make everyone in my program mad. Project gets shut down for several months. The interesting thing about Spark Seed Spread is it taught me to view my failure as an opportunity to learn. I started an informal focus group with my peers. You know, the ones that I made mad earlier? Okay, everybody, what works? What doesn't work? What are the barriers to technology? Now, I'm accepted to the next level called SEED, and I'm gonna do a pilot project, pilot program called the Eat at Home that we heard about earlier. I am creating a prototype, and I'm going to get that data using cheap athletic watches, portable EKG devices, Apple watches. I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna prevent hospitalizations and deaths. But more importantly, I'm bringing point of care diagnostics into the home. So yes, my veterans aren't coming to the VA, I'm coming to them. And yes, someday I will sleep better at night. I just wanna thank everyone here, especially the VH Innovator Network, my innovation special, uh, specialist, Caitlin Rawlings, thank you. Oh, 
Awesome. Thank you, Georgie. That was a great story and right on time too. Well done. Um, can you talk a little bit more about when you initially applied to the network? What was that like for you? Like how did, how was the experience for you of applying to Sparkseed and Spread? I think we lost Georgie's feed. So, okay. So we are going to move on. Um, we are going to move right on. Yep, okay, we're going to move on. Um, and while we do that and get our next toast, a participant queued up on screen, you should shortly be seeing a QR code. Um, we would love for you to actually use this QR code and go on and give us some live feedback. So I will be reading questions and comments um, as we go through the, the session today. So we'd love to hear from you all. Um, if you have any questions live for our presenters or for us to ask, um, please again feel free to use the QR code that you'll see queued up on screen. And go ahead and enter some questions in the live chat. That would be great. All right. And so with that, I'm going to move on to my friend and colleague, Indra Sandal. Um, she is here today to talk about her innovative program called One Card, That's All. Indra, can you tell us a little bit more about your innovative idea? I think so. They are going to run the video for 30 seconds. Hi, I'm Indra Sandal, Innovation Specialist at Memphis VA Medical Center. And I'm here to tell you about the One Card That's All pilot program that will implement digital business cards at six pilot locations within the VA. These cards will use NFC technology to tap and share contact information. How simple. Digital business cards are the perfect way to boost employee engagement, improve the employee and veteran experience, and promote networking. Connecting with others has never been easier thanks to the innovative and tech-savvy digital business cards and VHA Innovators Network to make this happen. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I think so just now you saw the card, how it looks like, it's like a business card. So on average, each VA hospital spent $40,000 every year to get the paper business card. So when employee changes jobs, location, and all the business card changes. So how I got into this idea that two years ago, I ordered the paper business card in Memphis and I got the 500 cards after six months and an error in my credential. Boom, the idea came up, can we have something which we ha can change it on an automated platform and have some business card which looks like a credit card. So here we are uh, in 2020, we uh, use the concept by buying the commercial card to beta test with the people and then see how it works out. And when we did the beta testing, it seems out that uh, the card will be too expensive if we are going to buy for the VA employees. So we applied for the seed investment, got $25,000, did the contracting and the contracting was the most smoothest part which can ever happen anywhere on this part. Within two months, we got the contract and the cards are there. So now we have almost 1,200 employees who are getting these cards, which will cost only one to two dollars, but made in VA, not in outside. And that's going to come to every all the six uh, sites which we are using: Florida, LA, and a lot of the sites in the Mid South Region One. My journey with INET as investee last and this year is quite amazing, since I believe in the saying practice what you preach. Being innovation specialist, I lead innovation program and prep my employees to become innovator using the platform of VHA Innovator Network. But this experience as investee made me believe more on this saying, you don't lead people what you say to them. You lead them by what they see you do. Thank you so much. 10 seconds left. Thank you, Indra, that was well done. Um, can you tell us, I loved hearing about it, and I know I've been one of the fortunate ones who was able to actually get in early on the one card that's all and pull it up on my phone. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the journey? You're a woman of many hats, um, many hats. I don't think I could even list them all in the next couple of minutes, but tell us more about your journey from becoming an innovation specialist and being that person who's really helping others to crossing over and actually becoming an innovator too. What was that like for you? 
Yeah, that that's like a really good question, uh, Matt. And I think so. It's asked in several platforms wherever you present. Because being an innovation specialist, you are running the show in your hospital and empowering these employees to do something new. And they are coming up with that. And on the other hand, you also get so much inspiration from them and think, can I do something also what I'm trying to do and then show them this is how it works. So that's why I said it's so, so good that when you are doing this stuff, they are seeing it. And they don't think that we are something wasting more time on this. If you fail, that's fine. Let's try. So I think so for me, the mantra is that if I'm empowering my employees, I have to show them how it works. Not only by saying this works like this, this works like that. No, I am running with you. I am going to do the project. I will show you how it works. And if it doesn't work, it will also not work for me. So that's how I, I run the innovation program and other programs also, which I'm uh, doing at this time. Yeah, that's fantastic. Awesome. Thank you, Indra. Keep up the good work. Okay. Thank you so much, Matt. And thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. All right. Next up, we have Jillian Thompson, who's here to tell us about her program called Music Listening for Better Health. Jillian, how are you today? I'm good. How are you? Thank I'm you all for having me. Awesome. <laughs> Still loving the backdrop. Love all the instruments behind you. Great to see it. I'm really excited to hear your story today. So go ahead and get started. All right, thank you. Have you ever had surgery? You know, they wheel you into the pre-op area where you'll wait until it's time for the anesthesia. There are so many machines beeping and staff talking. And even though rationally, you know that they probably aren't talking about you and the beeps are nothing to worry about, your stress level goes up. And if you're like me, you take, they've taken your glasses and the whole place is just a blurry mess, making you stress even more. So now imagine if a nurse asked you what kind of music do you like? You know, what would you choose? You've made your selection and now the nurse gives you headphones and presses play. Your entire sound environment has changed. You will relax and your body will go into surgery in a more relaxed state. Now, your body is still experiencing the same amount of pain that it would without the music, but your brain has to choose to focus on the pain or the pleasure, and it wants to focus on pleasure. So post-surgery, your perception of the pain is less than it would be without the music. And in turn, you will need less pain medication and have an easier recovery process. Now that is just one example of the many benefits of music. I'm a music therapist and I've spent my entire career sharing the benefits of music for our health and well-being. So I decided to apply to the Innovators Network with my project, Music Listening for Better Health. I was beyond excited to get accepted into this program as I have enjoyed their education sessions, as well as utilized projects and interventions that were created through the Innovators Network with my veterans. As a music therapist, people often think my job entails playing cute little songs and teaching guitar lessons, which is not the case. And often my ideas are not taken seriously by other healthcare providers, and are seen as too unusual for the healthcare setting. Being a part of this program has given me a sense of community and validation in addition to new skills and knowledge. Working on this project has given me the opportunity to educate disciplines and departments throughout the medical center that I've not previously had interactions with, allowing me to advocate for the use of music. This has opened doors to create new programs and interventions for our veterans as well as de develop new collaborations for use after this project has concluded. Um, even before I worked in healthcare, music was always a huge part of my life and is even more so now as someone with a medical condition that requires monthly infusions and regular MRIs. I understand the importance of something as simple as music and how helpful it can be to calm oneself and make a procedure more bearable. I've relied on music to make my own flare-ups of double vision more tolerable and can control my sound environment when too many sounds and distractions affect and overwhelm my auditory processing needs. Through the Innovators Network, I've gained the knowledge and support to continue to develop and share my ideas, as well as create new opportunities to use this safe, evidence-based approach to help improve our veterans' health and quality of life. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Jillian. I love that story. Um, it's been really great to, to hear about your journey. Can you talk a little bit more about how this experience has changed your life going from music therapist to now innovative music therapist and innovative VA employee? I'd love to hear a bit more about that. Well, for me, I am, I am this person and the old people I work with will tell you that I'm always like, hey, you know what we should do? And I always have this idea and 
you know, not everybody's always into that. Like I said, as a music therapist, you know, being like, hey, we should use music during surgery. People think it was strange, but it, being a part of this has really helped to validate that even though some of my ideas may be a little off the wall and crazy, that, you know, it's really nice to be able to share those ideas and meet other people who believe in those same things and creating new projects and innovating new ideas and knowing that there is a place now that I can go to with these ideas and have people like me that I can share them with. It's, it's been really great. Yeah, absolutely. You're really, yeah, you become part of a community of, of people with crazy ideas, right? Who want to yeah, see what we can exactly, do and exactly. <laughs> how far we can push the envelope and make things better. Um, and so what's next for your project? Um, so we are looking to um, do multiple things. We are looking to take the iPods onto the inpatient medical units more so that patients have them while they're hospitalized in the ICUs. We're looking for the acute psychiatric unit to be able to share with those veterans to help to control that environment. Um, the GI clinic and the chemotherapy clinic have also expressed interest as well as women's health to kind of utilize music as a part of a procedure, just like you would for an MRI. Yeah, it's such a smart idea because it's such a great non-invasive way to hopefully make the patient's experience just that much better for them yep. and a Very bit more simple. calming, right? It's yeah, yeah, that's really fantastic. So awesome. Well, thank you again for step stepping up and telling your story today. It's been great to follow along with your journey and I look forward to hearing what's next. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Jillian. All right, next up we have Hannah Katz here to tell us about her program called IESP or Individualized Emotional Stability Plan. Hannah, are you with us today? Yes, I am. There Thank you. There you are. Awesome. So uh, looking forward to hearing more about you and your story. You are welcome to get started. Thank you. I get emails from everyone from the Census Bureau on up. One day, I received an email containing one of the greatest kept secrets of federal work that asked me if I had an idea for an innovation and would I like to try for a spot on the newly formed Los Angeles Innovation Team. Well, this sounded intriguing and I had been thinking about an idea for months, so why not? This led me to creating the IESP Individualized Emotional Stability Plan. Imagine how rewarding it was for me to finally have people telling me my ideas were great, worthy of pursuing, and that I could be an innovator. I remembered one of my most difficult challenges, the time that I first heard my youngest 10-year-old child's ongoing list of medical problems. The doctor told me she had a hole in her heart needing surgery, but that's not all. She has pulmonary hypertension, but that's not all. She has COPD, but that's not all. And as the list continued, I was shocked and I had to handle the stress of this life-changing event alone, overwhelmed with the unknown ramifications for our lives. Most people receive difficult news, experience life-altering events, but how in that shattering depth of pain do you find the steps to survive, regroup, return to a new normal, and eventually begin to thrive? This was where I began to create the IESP last year. I spent the spark year working on a prototype that provides a personalized framework, resources, and a lifeline necessary to traverse these difficulties while utilizing unique to me solutions. IESP is a personalized step-by-step -step protocol that can be quickly filled out and rewind, reminds one of their personal strengths and preferences. It does not replace therapy. It is another personalized tool in an individual's emotional stability arsenal. Little did I know how it would come in handy when I lost my youngest child in June. I had to tell the family what had happened, prepare for a funeral, and so much more. I used the IESP prototype to help me survive these difficult days and begin to rebuild my life. What if I didn't have IESP, this backbone of focused options I needed at this time of tragedy? I work with a veteran who suffered multiple traumas, turned to meth, and must move out of his apartment due to his reckless um, personal behavior. Lack of coping skills, minimal reminders of personal strengths, and a, clear, and a um, clear framework to handle a crisis is a problem in the GLA veteran population. The IES Spark project resulted in a prototype ready for seed testing. My name is Hannah Katz, VASH social worker, and I'm happy to report that my project was chosen for a second time, and I will be working this year on incorporating its use at the Los Angeles VA. 
Thank you so much, Hada, for sharing your story. And I have to say, every time I've heard it, and it continues to really strike a chord in me, um, in the way in which you've made it personalized, and it's something that's really true and near and dear to your heart, and using your experience to help our patients who you know are having the same struggles. So thank you again, just from all of us, for going out there and really trying to help our patients who are, you know are in these same situations. So you talked a bit about this year, you're, you're gonna do a prototype. Can you talk a bit more about what that's gonna be like? Do you, do you have any ideas? Like what's the prototype process gonna be like for you, the seed process, I should say? Well, I have the prototype and that's what I spent last year coming up with. It's still tweaked always just a little here and there, but basically it's finished. So we're going to be, um, the goal is to have a, two or three locations, one of them being um, building 500, the hospital. So I'm going to try to work with one of the, with the head nurse to get um, some of the surgical units, because if people fill out the form ahead of time, they, they, it gives a clue to the nurses and, and the doctors, like uh, what are some of the things they like to do, kind of breathing things or internal things, external things. There's all these different parts and it'll give them an idea uh, of clarity. I also want to work with uh, some of the psychiatric um, groups or you know, outpatient groups, and um, then work with, of course, my uh, VASH uh, uh, veterans. So um, those are kind of the areas that we're focusing on. And honestly, the truth is I actually had in mind this could be for staff as well, as well as um, the veterans. And I think it has, because it has ramifications for everyone. So that's another thing, but I'm not sure how I'm going to approach the staff with it, but that might be one of the arms we go for as well. Yeah, it really aligns kind of under employee whole health, I feel like. It's just one of those mm -hmm. things where you, we spend so much time planning for other situations in our lives, and we don't necessarily always plan for these type of emotional emergencies, and we probably should put a lot more time and effort thinking about that potentially going forward. Right. So thank it, it's you. It's very simple to do. And you don't have to redo it all that often. So it's 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 great for that kind of thing. Right. Thank you again. I really appreciate the chance to present. Yeah, you as well. Thank you so Thank much you. for volunteering to tell your story here today. We appreciate it. Thank you. All right, next up, we're gonna shift over to Terry Olinger, and she is gonna tell us about her awesome product, um, Drop Ease, and her experience, and it's been quite a journey to get from where she started with seeing a problem to uh, having an awesome prototype today. So Terry, uh, can you tell us a bit more about your journey from employee in Cincinnati to innovator today? Certainly. Um, have you ever had a patient labeled as non-compliant? Well, I have, and it nearly cost him his eyesight. I asked him why he wasn't using his eye drops and he simply said he couldn't squeeze the bottle. So I knew at that moment I had to do something. I'm Terry Olinger and I'm the nurse case manager for eye surgery at the Cincinnati VA. And this is my story of how I had developed Droppies. Droppies is a simple, easy to use eye drop delivery system designed for those with reduced or limited hand dexterity due to conditions such as ALS, rheumatoid arthritis, Parkinson's, or just generalized weakness due to aging. As an eye case manager, I've noticed there are far too many patients having difficulty delivering their eye drops to themselves. So they either give up, leading to poor outcomes, impaired vision, or low self-esteem, or they just squeeze way too hard, use too much product, leading to, uh, leading to numerous refills, leading to increased costs. So I took to the internet to find a product to meet all their needs. There were some to help squeeze, but not to regulate how hard, and one for aiming, but not for squeezing, nothing that did it all or that met all their needs. So I went to the drawing board and sketched out a few ideas that I thought could meet all their needs. It was at this time that I got an email from Lindsay Reigler, my local innovation specialist, requesting ideas just like mine. So I applied for and was awarded investment dollars from the Innovators Network. I collaborated with engineering students from the University of Cincinnati to assist with the development of a working prototype and have recently worked with Pixel and Timber and the NTTAP in Cleveland to improve on the design. Utilizing human-centered design principles, we demoed the first prototype with uh, veteran volunteers, taking that feedback to reimagine the prototype. The current design allows for most prescription eye drop bottles have a, has a soft iPad in three sizes to assist 
assist with positioning droppies for stabilization and, and the ergonomic handle for easier use. Droppies is a squirt gun-like prototype that no matter how hard or weak the squeeze, it'll dispense only one drop. Um, it'll aim, help the patient aim and stabilize the dropper, meeting all their needs, improving outcomes, decreasing costs, and enhancing self-esteem. We have additionally adapted the eyedropper for eardrops as well. We look forward to testing this in several VA sites. You just drop the bottle in, adjust for size, lay it against the eye, and squeeze. Droppies, it's that easy. Fantastic, Terry, thank you. Um, let me ask a question. How long ago did you originally apply to the SPARC program? Um, I started in 2019. Okay. And um, yeah. So it's been three years plus during COVID and it's, that's, and I think it's, that's one of the key points I just wanted to emphasize. When people think about innovation, they often think about quick, right? People want results now, they want changes today. And just the, the perseverance it must have taken to get through three years of development and, and feedback, right? And I've seen many of the iterations of your prototype. I know it's come a long way since the first one that you built a few years back. Um, tell me, what was it you, because how long have you worked at the VA? I've been with the VA for just over 20 years now. Oh, wow. Okay. And so what was it that made you take that leap from being an employee who was tired of seeing employee or, or staff or veterans having a problem to actually submitting an idea to the Innovators Network? Like what finally kind of pushed you to, to submit that idea? Well, I, as I said in the, I, I had a patient who everybody kind of writ, wrote off as non-compliant and he was losing his eyesight. He had, um, he had some glaucoma. And I just sat him down and asked him, you know, why are you not doing your eye drops? And he just told me he couldn't squeeze his bottles. And it really just broke my heart that it was not because he wanted to not do his eye drops. And he was just really saddened by the fact he's losing his vision for, through no fault of his own. So he was kind of the final straw for you of like, okay, I got to do something. I have yeah. to help these patients. I can't do this anymore. That's fantastic. Yeah. I know, and you're gonna help a lot of people with this. And, and Terry's product is, she pitched on the marketplace, which I'm gonna talk about coming up a little bit later too. So I'm really excited to see what's next for you, Terry. So keep up the great work. Thank you. Thank you as well. All right, next up we have Jason Ramirez. He is gonna talk about his idea for automatic inactivation of unused opioids. Jason, can you hear me okay? Are you good to go? Yes, I'm ready, Matt. Thank let's, you so much. Let's do this. Hello, VA. <laughs> Hello, my name is Jason Ramirez. I'm an anesthesiologist at the Salt Lake City VA. During my medical training at the Mayo Clinic, I had a profound experience. While making pain rounds in the hospital, we came across a child who was essentially bedridden with cancer pain. We recommended treatment with a fentanyl lollipop. Later in the afternoon, the child was observed to be sitting on the floor lollipop in his mouth playing video games. That is the power of opioid medication when used appropriately. But as we all know, there has been a dark side to the use of these medications. The use of opioids for the treatment of pain was heavily promoted in the 2000s. Unfortunately, the widespread use of these medications in undertrained hands has greatly contributed to the opioid crisis. Prescription opioids are still killing people. The economic cost is staggering. Adolescents gain access to opioids primarily through the prescription supply of others. Left op opioids are common, especially after surgery. Most people do not dispose of their leftover opioid medications. Pause and think for a moment. Do you have old prescriptions sitting in your medicine cabinet? Several years ago, I met a patient at the VA who commented on the lack of technology within prescription medication bottles. This comment stuck with me and the gears have been turning ever since. In the fall of 2020, through the VA, I had the opportunity to apply to an innovation design program with MIT. During my application interview, I was asked if I had any ideas for a project. I responded with a vague idea about incorporating technology into a medication bottle. Through MIT and the VA Innovators Network, my team has developed a novel product to help address the opioid crisis. The goal being to enhance safety while preserving access for the legitimate use of these medications. Our project is essentially a prescription bottle redesign 
which gives the bottle cap the capability to inactivate unused opioids at a future date through automation. We've spent the past year with MIT and the VA Innovators Network working towards a functional prototype. I'm happy to report that this was achieved this past August. The next step is to pilot the prototype. The eventual goal is to change the method in which opioids, as well as other medications are disposed, not only across the VA, but across all healthcare systems. I'm a physician, not a businessman, not an engineer, and certainly not an inventor. But my life experiences and time working with veterans planted a seed, a seed that the VA has helped turn into an exciting opportunity to make a real impact in healthcare. In closing, I would say, believe in yourself. Set ridiculously high standards and put yourself out there. Great things are possible with VA. Awesome, thank you, Jason. Love the advice too there at the end. Um, can I, so question for you. So can you talk more about when you had your initial idea, what was some of the feedback you got when you first put this idea in front of patients and providers? How did they, how, how receptive were they to the idea of this inactivation of opioids kind of on the shelf as opposed to just hoping you'd throw them away or recycle them someday? Well, some of the initial responses had to do with, you know, this has been tried before and, you know, it's just not going to work because we didn't have the, the concept of the automation yet built in there. So it was this feedback um, with people and with experts in industry that, that, and research that showed us of all the existing uh, methods for disposal, ours is different because it doesn't require patient action. In fact, it actually requires patient action to defeat the purpose of the bottle. Um, so that's what distinguishes ours from the other solutions out in the marketplace right now. Yeah, and I think from talking with you before, I know that most people want to do the right thing. They just don't know what to do with it, right? So it sounds like your idea really just assists people and nudges them in the right direction. Uh, that's exactly correct. Uh, surveys in the literature show that most people want to dispose of their unused opioid medications, but they just can't. Either they find it too convenient, inconvenient or, or too burdensome. Yeah, this is such a great idea. And it's another one to highlight of all the stories we continue to hear throughout these three days of employees just seeing problems, right? And, and just observing as things are brought to them, things you've seen throughout the course of your career and just being willing to take that step and explore it and, and see what can come of it. And so this is a great project, Jason. I really like all the others, right? Today, before and after you, look forward to seeing what's next for you. So thank you for taking the time and sharing your story with us today. Thank you. Awesome, thanks, Jason. All right, next up we have Stacy Garcia here to tell us about her innovation program and her story. And Stacy has had quite a journey. Um, her program is called Help is Only a Phone Call Away. Um, hi, Stacy. how are you today? Hi, oh, really nervous. <laughs> you got this. Very much so. All right, you're ready, for, ready to get started whenever you are. Okay, great, thank you. Have you ever had a veteran come into your clinic suffering from a psychotic or paranoid episode that was intensified because he or she could not get a hold of their provider or clinic? This is a common challenge that many veterans face during their crisis, and they know they need help, but they can't reach the help in a timely manner. Hello, my name is Stacy Garcia, and I'm a registered nurse in the outpatient mental health department here at the VA Greater Los Angeles in Southern California. Today, I'm here to tell you about my story of how I've set out to solve this problem and ensure our veterans to get the help they need and deserve. Four years ago, as a member of our outpatient mental health section-based shared governance committee, my mental health nurses, colleagues, and I came up with the idea of a quick phone reference guide placed onto a three by five dry erase magnet. This simple card was intended to help veterans remember telephone numbers in a crisis, as well as those in a non-crisis situation to contact their mental health clinicians. I was appointed to spearhead the project with the assistance of my colleague, Alice Allen. Alice and I sought the help and support from many departments. We went to our mental health leadership team with our idea and prototype, but were turned down opting for a less expensive business card size. But we remained determined because we knew our version was a better alternative. We then asked the volunteer services for help funding for the project, but were turned down again. We looked into fundraising for the money, but were disappointed to learn that we would need authorization from higher administration. 
So we sought the help of the Quality Improvement Department who encouraged us to apply for a new program called the VHA Innovators Network Spark Seed Spread Program. We applied and we were thrilled when our project was selected. We had a few tough months at the beginning of the SPARK program. At times we cried due to frustration. We had difficulties with research and data collecting and sometimes thought we would never achieve our goal. With the help and support of the innovation specialists, the INET classes, the guidance of the Aspen Lab Center trainers, we learned how to conduct research, how to interview stakeholders, to verify the product's usability, and how to develop a prototype for the consumer. It was no easy task, but we finally accomplished our goal of helping the most vulnerable veterans get the help they need by creating a solution they truly can use. Because after all, they're the ones who helped design it. Alice and I remained determined. We never gave up hope. We had to constantly shift gears and eventually overcame the obstacles because we were dedicated in solving the problem and improving the experience for veterans. I'm happy to announce our perseverance did not go unnoticed. Alice and I are honored to be the recipients of this year's 2022 Innovators Network Tanked Award. The Tank Award recognizes a team that can move past the solution or result they want and are willing to put in the work to find the solution that their audience truly needs. I hope our story inspires you to persevere your own ideas. I thank you for your time and good luck with your endeavors. Thank you, Stacy. That was perfect. Um, and right on time. So I was trying to count and I lost track. How many times were you told no or get, sh had to pivot in another direction during the course of your journey? I've only told you a few. <laughs> um, <laughs> I must say about 20 times and we were so completely frustrated um, because I'm working with a huge group of, of mental health nurses, you know, all from different areas of mental health. And we all tried to find ways of trying to get this project going and funding it. And it was through, like I said, um, just one person saying something to another person and it got through to um, the quality improvement and high risk ability people. And they're the one who told us about this new project. I mean, they also told us about Shark Tank too. Um, but since this was such a new, new program, we said, why not try this one first? Yeah, yeah, this is, and then <clears throat> Shark Tank is the place to go once you have the idea and it's kind of vetted and, and fully fleshed yeah. out. Yeah, and I mean, I, I just thinking about this, what advice would you give to other employees who are listening who similarly have been told no 18 times and they don't want to hear it 19 times? Like, how, what would you say to them to kind of encourage them to keep going? Well, like I said, um, don't give up because uh, eventually, you know, someone's going to listen. Eventually, someone's going to reach out and help you. Um, yeah, we've had a lot of positive feedback from different VAs wanting to, you know, help out with the project and everything. Um, and so we're so grateful for this program and, and spreading the word, you know, and, and, you know, we're also helping trying to end the stigma of mental health and just having little types of techniques and stuff to help our veterans cope through certain situations, um, can really ease the, the situations and matters within clinics. Yeah, I mean, it's worth persevering to do the right thing, right? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Exactly. Thank you, Stacy. Great job. Great to hear your story today. And um, hopefully, I look forward to connecting with you soon. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Next up, we have David Maddow. Hopefully, David, I didn't butcher your name too, too badly. Um, he's here to tell us about his program called Text to Serve. David, are you ready to tell us about your journey today? You might be muted, David. <laughs> yes, I am muted and it was not undoing it, so, but I am here. Oh, it happens. Let me not leave the meeting. All right, <laughs> I am ready. All right. All right. So putting on and coordinating events is a huge undertaking. Meetings and messages and emails and miscommunications. When the dust settles, you realize the time and effort wasted. Do you wish there was a better way? Good afternoon. My name is David Mado, a voluntary service specialist at the Orlando VA Healthcare System. And I'm here to tell you a story about my journey with INET and growing as an employee. So we learned early on in voluntary services that coordinating events are so important. Being able to successfully communicate with our volunteers, veteran service organizations, community partners and staff 
are required for us to serve our veterans. So my supervisor decided that this is a problem that we needed to solve and put in for the spark seed spread here through IDET. This would allow us to approach the problem with a structured process to be more successful. Here I enter as a brand new employee in voluntary service who knew all too well these pains, being not only a volunteer, but also an interim of Soldiers Angels. At this point, I've been at the VA for about two weeks and now I'm leading a new project while learning my primary job. Oh, was I in for a ride. But by building this system, we can easily communicate. Easier said than done. I ran many teams in the past, but man, communication failures, emails with interns, lining up teams meetings, just so many small problems that just brought the whole program to a halt. What were we here for again? Oh yes, to solve communication issues we are having with our stakeholders. So like any project, sometimes the best method is to scrap everything. I had to take the focus, our focus from finishing a working application to building a customer experience. What is a customer experience, you ask? How would I, as a user, like an application to work? What features? Can I send documents? Can I create groups? We just need to create the framework needed to design the application before we build anything. We ran into several problems with scheduling because of time zones and work schedules. It seemed like one problem after another, almost like playing the what if game. What if I hit snooze for five more minutes? So I broke us up into smaller teams. So at least one member could be at the meeting. We accomplished more in a week than we did the first three months of our projects. I learned a lot about myself, what I needed to do as a leader and how to operate under a load of stress, especially while multitasking. Let me take you back to the beginning, now where this moment where the dust settles, but now we have a plan and our next step would be to build an application prototype. So all internal and external stakeholders can effectively and easily communicate to organize these events. Thank you for listening to my journey. Excellent, thank you, David. Definitely appreciated hearing about your journey today. Um, tell us a little bit more about that experience of starting at the VA and then a week later just being thrust into working on an innovation project. What was that like? I'm gonna be honest, I felt like I was back in the military, <laughs> being given a new mission out of nowhere with zero training. So uh, it was actually one of the best experiences. I really enjoy uh, the fact that we have something like this in the VA to innovate. Uh, so I was thrilled to be able to take on the project, even though it put a lot of you know stress on me with my workload. But overall, once I'm able to get this project off the ground and built, it's going to make life so much easier for all the CDC and this application can be used further uh, once we develop it. So. Yeah, and it it sounds like it's really something that aligns with something you're passionate with. So it was like it seemed like it was a very natural fit. Yes, and uh, I'm so happy that we have programs like these. So we, so we, that employees like myself and just like Stacy uh, before me are able to, you know, look at these problems and find fixes and and get the support we need to actually accomplish this thing. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Keep up the great work, and we look forward to hearing what's next from you and your team. Thank you. Thanks, David. All right, next up we have Barry Peterson who is here to tell us about his program for building con called Building Confidence, Build Psychological Safety. Um, Barry, you're looking excellent today. Love the background. Looking forward to hearing your, sterny, your story and all about your journey through the Innovators Network um, and your experience from employee to now employee innovator. So Barry, the floor is yours whenever you're ready. Thank you, Matt. I'm Barry Peterson and I'm an educator at the Reno VA. My innovation journey began back in 2019 because I had a problem. I felt stuck with role plays as the approved solution for skill reinforcement. But after a couple of years of actually using role plays, I had to conclude it was just not good enough. You know, our veterans talk about facing the terror of combat and the fear of freezing up. The only thing that gets soldiers through the stress is high intensity, realistic training. For us, Seeing through lecture on soft skills is just not enough. You have to burn that skill in so that when the chips are down, you can function. And true, with soft skills, there are no bullets per se, but sometimes it can sure feel like life or death. When the conversation goes sideways, if the training is burned in the skill, then you can still stay kind, empathic, and communicate effectively without panicking or forgetting about the humanity of the person you're talking with. So as I struggled with the pain of role plays, an old friend came up, tapped me on the shoulder, Tell me about a new job. And she said, hey, Barry, 
have you ever thought about being an innovator? <laughs> I said, what, me? Do you mean big VA believes in me out here in Little Reno, Nevada? Look, I'm an ox. I just put my head down, I don't innovate, I work with the tools I'm given. It never dawned on me there could be another way, but she was persistent and she made me a believer. And she said, hey Barry, maybe we could try out something new. I mean, maybe we could use virtual reality for healthcare soft skills reinforcement. So in FY21, our employees got to actually try off the shelf VR and they told us they liked it, but they like it more if the virtual reality scenarios were more relevant to life in an actual hospital. So this past year, we set out to find a way to custom build our, our own VR scenarios. We were super excited and optimistic when we found a prototype. Then we discovered that the system operates on the vendor's cloud, which we learned is a big no-go for the federal government. So we went through the classic stages of grief. I got angry, faced denial, and actually thought for a split second that maybe we could just bend the rules a little bit to make this happen. And then the team put their foot down collectively and accepted the real reality and vowed to not give up. We became a team of oxen. We are Team Reno. And as we say in Nevada, we are battle born. And critically, INET never gave up on us. Just during the last week of the fiscal year, the end of September, the contract was awarded and we can now begin our pilot. This year, Team Reno will build on that foundation. We have many local and national groups who want to help us evaluate if custom built VR is a good fit for their training needs. We believe that practice and purposeful feedback builds confidence so that staff can have greater presence and empathy. After all, that's why we're here, to provide a safe healing place for veterans and their families. Thank you. Thanks so much, Barry. Always love hearing about your program um, and your idea. So as someone who's taken a lot of live in-person trainings and done a lot of these simulations, I always found myself wondering, how can we do this better? But I never really could make the leap to how to do it. So how did you first arrive at the idea that a virtual environment would be the best place or the best solution for this? You know, it, it didn't dawn on me either, Matt, until really our innovation specialist said, hey, didn't you used to work in virtual, believe it or not, I used to work in the virtual reality for training field years ago. And uh, I never connected the dots until this person came in and said, Barry, what about, why are you not using virtual reality to address this, this issue? And all of a sudden the light bulbs went off and it really, so credit to our innovation specialist who uh, connected the dots in a way that I wasn't even, uh, my head was down. I wasn't even thinking about it. Yeah, quick shout out to all of our innovation specialists out there. This is what we do, right, every day. Just make some amazing, um, make some amazing connections and really help you all to see the, see the light sometimes, right? Barry, Absolutely. what's been the feedback thus far when you've put this idea in front of staff and in front of veterans in, in terms of telling them training could happen in more of a virtual environment? How have they responded it's been amazing. to that? So, thanks, Matt. So last year we had um, off the shelf kind of generic scenarios and, and we ran a, a number, uh, almost 30 of our employees through them and they were just blown away. They just saw the potential immediately. When you have an in-person experience with virtual reality, it can automatically things start to click. It's funny, it's like the plasticity of the mind works with you and you're like, oh my gosh, I could use that for this or this and this. So a lot of excitement and really not as much apprehension as we expected because you know VR is kind of a technology that people have different experiences with and they, so what we found really positive overall and just a lot of light bulbs, a lot of excitement about it. And even we found that people walked away from a training experience saying, oh my gosh, I feel refreshed. That's amazing, yeah, and and, and well needed, I think, sometimes too, right? <laughs> For sure. Awesome, thanks, thanks Barry. Man. I appreciate you telling your story again here today. It's great to hear from you, and I uh, look forward to hearing more from you soon. Great to be here, thank you, Matt. Thanks, Barry. All right, so next up, we are gonna shift gears a little bit here. So that was the last of our innovation stories. So if you remember now, our next category as Allison introduced at the beginning as we're moving on to innovation demos, which is really more broad stories that are gonna focus on collaborations between VA innovators and external partners. So we are working together with the industry 
um, to help to develop some of the most innovative solutions of the future. So the first one we have up today is going to be a collaboration between Dave Bertoni and Kim Balicki. Um, Kim is out of our Orlando VA Medical Center and Dave um, is from Levy Sense Medical and so they're here to tell us about their amazing collaboration. So looking forward to hearing more about this one. So Dave, Kim, the floor is yours. Dave, I think you're muted too, my friend. And I was off to such a good start. It's Welcome everybody always. <laughs> from, from here in Boston. My name is Dave Bertoni and I'm with Levisense Medical, as Matt said. And I want to thank everybody for joining us and thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I'm really excited to tell you about our experience with the Greenhouse Initiative. Um, spoiler alert, it was great. So the quantity and the quality of input that I got was extraordinary. In fact, in 35 years of product development, I've never had access to user input like this, but um, much of it has to go, uh, much credit has to go to my innovation specialist partner, Kim, for her execution and, uh, and, and organization. Kim. Welcome everyone. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to hear how Dave and I collaborated. All right. Well, thanks. Levisense has been working on mattress technology for the treatment and prevention of pressure injuries, also known as pressure sores or bed sores, which you may not know, but it's a major public health problem. Um, I was interested in working with the VA because pressure injuries are really common and deadly for people with spinal cord injury. And did you know that the VA is the largest healthcare provider in the world for um, SCI? So what better place to get input to attack an important public health problem than the VA? So I discovered the Greenhouse Initiative online, filled out an application, and I got a call back and was given the opportunity to give a three minute presentation. So Kim, you were there, what was it like from your end? <laughs> So Dave gave a three minute pitch to the INET innovation specialist. I heard Dave's pitch and I was immediately intrigued. I know that pressure wounds are a problem and they're very painful. So I immediately asked our nurses, is this a problem and would we like to participate? I got a quick response of a yes. And we decided not only would Orlando participate, but we would lead this greenhouse initiative. So about a month later, seven uh, VA medical centers were signed up to participate. We were on our way. Uh, the program consisted of four virtual sessions. I think, Kim, it took us about two months. Um, we discussed um, with 21 or 28 uh, subject matter experts. And su subject matter experts are like surgeons and nurses, wound care specialists, but also transportation, home health care, OT, PT, um, infection control. We formed an efficient working relationship, I think. We explored really what the veterans' needs were and the challenges of the caregivers. Um, at the end of that, we really prioritized a number of objectives and we collaborated on features and, and feature concepts. So our conclusions were, one, sure, treatment is important, but prevention is the key. Uh, second, is if a veteran is unfortunate and does get a pressure injury, these things take months to heal. So get the veterans home in a healing environment as soon as possible, safely and comfortable. Avoid reoccurrence, if possible, of pressure injuries, and then reduce the burden on the caregiver. So. With all that information, it took us about six months for us to get our prototype together. With that, we produced and brought our prototype to Orlando and Cleveland um, for evaluation. Uh, it was in the form of a sophisticated hospital bed. Is our slide up? Can you see it? I think it's supposed to be. You got it, okay. So um, you can see the... Um, the bed up in the upper right. It was a sophisticated hospital bed. Uh, and the bed surface is made of support um, cells filled with air called sensor cells. You see that in the upper left of the, of the slide. Each sensor cell is a valve and, and a sensor inside that controls the pressure to protect the veteran, to show pressure mapping on the bedside and record the repositioning movements. With the cells, we can control the pressure of inside uh, and of individual or groups of cells. 
either to make them very firm, to make it easy for transfers or softer for comfort protection, or even zero to create a cavity to protect or eliminate pressure entirely on an area of concern. So with that, we got input from over 179 uh, special um, subject matter experts that were like anesthesiologists, biomed, executive, um, PTOT, it, it ran the gamut. A hundred actually tried out the features of the bed. My partner, Jason, and I took copious notes of every reaction and comment. Um, Kim, what would you say? So as you can imagine, March of 2022 was an exciting day when a big semi pulled up at the Orlando VA and a prototype was in a crate. We, uh, we brought the prototype up to Orlando uh, VA MedSim and we set it up and we had, like Dave said, over a hundred subject matter experts come through and give feedback. And it was a very exciting time for the pressure wound um, team because they got to actually physically see what their input and their feedback as a deliverable. And one thing that Dave did learn about me is I take my coffee breaks very seriously, but we didn't always have time for lunch because we were so busy with our subject matter experts coming through. Yeah, we were there for a week, took all that information. And how do you translate all that input into solutions for veterans? Well, we had to completely rethink how our technology should be used. Um, so if you look on the lower right of that slide, you'll see our new prototype. Um, what we took, um, so why is it look so different? Well, it's designed for the home. If the goal is prevention, prevention starts in the home. You need a practical bed in the home for people with spinal cord injury and other mobility limitations. It has to be practical for multi-story homes or mobile homes and go in the bedroom. Um, then we have to get the veterans home and healing as quickly as we can. So that's when the auto pressure regulation of the sensor cell works. So it does it automatically. We want to avoid reoccurrence. So we have like bedside mapping, data reporting, and we use that for coaching to give the veteran the tools that to engage in their own wellness. And then to reduce the caregiver burden, we've got an automated repositioning feature and a transfer mode that makes it easier. And it has to be simple enough for home use. So we're still evolving and wait till you see the next version. At the heart of innovation is empathy. And one thing that I learn about this project is the feedback that came back is our veterans do not want to sleep alone. They wanted to sleep with their partner. And so that's why the bed, the prototype version that is uh, the current model right now does allow for two beds to be put together to ensure that our veterans can sleep with their partners. Um, this was a great project. I learned a lot with all projects. I learn a lot, but it really, it really touched my heart to hear our wound care team give Dave feedback and for Dave to take that feedback and put it into action. Thank you. Questions? No, this Comments, is- Comments, deletions, this is, corrections, anything? <laughs> Dave, you guys nailed it. This is fantastic. And it's it was a great story to lead off with. It's such a great way to hear and learn about the collaboration uh, between the outside innovative community and VA, right? And really uh, see how these solutions can evolve and develop just to help make care better for our patients, right? I mean, we're trying, especially with bed sores and pressure wounds, trying to make these things better for our patients. So I really commend you and I'm really glad we we're able to connect you with Kim and Cleveland, or Kim in Orlando and our Cleveland VA Medical Center. And I'm so excited to hear what comes next for you and your team. So thank you both for, for sharing your stories today. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thanks, Kim. All right, next up, we are moving on to Alex Wessner and Katie Braun. Um, Katie is another innovation specialist from Pittsburgh. Alex is from Xander, and they are here today to talk about their collaboration called Smart Captioning Glasses to help with hearing loss. So Alex and Katie, if you are ready, the floor is yours. Take it away. Awesome. Thanks so much, Matt. Like Matt said, my name is Katie Braun, and I'm the Innovation Specialist for VA Pittsburgh. I'm here with Alex Wessner, founder of Xander. We've been on our collaboration journey together for about a year now. And it was actually a first of its kind collaboration here for VA Pittsburgh. 
And we're super excited that we get to continue this opportunity with Xander moving forward. Alex, can you share a little bit more about Xander for us? Yes. Uh, so my company is developing a product to help people with hearing loss. And it's quite different. Um, we're using augmented reality smart glasses that are these to create an experience for people with hearing loss where they can literally see real-time captions of what other people are saying right in their field of view. Now we sought out the VA when we learned that the VA is the single largest purchaser of hearing aids in the country. So we learned that both hearing loss and tinnitus are among the top health concerns among veterans. We then learned about the INET Greenhouse Program we applied to be considered. We were soon invited to be pitched to a group of innovation specialists around the country, and we were thrilled to be accepted into the program. It really was a great match, both for Xander and VA Pittsburgh, given Xander's goals and VA's mission of providing top care through some new and innovative solutions. Additionally, this collaboration with Xander has allowed our staff the opportunity to be active participants in human-centered design thinking. As with any good human-centered design project, we really wanted to keep the human at the center of our collaboration. Our subject matter experts that were actually from across multiple VA sites participated in problem discovery and prototype feedback sessions. Just like Alex showed you there, we actually have a demo of the prototype Xander glasses to share that really will help provide insight into this prototype um, and this solution. So let's check out the demo. We get asked all the time, hey, what's it like to actually wear these caption glasses? So we made a short video so you could experience what it's like to put on the glasses, have a conversation with someone and get real-time captions of what other people are saying. Take a look. You slept well. I just made some coffee. Um, I'm making a fruit salad. I'm doing some green apples and some strawberries and some grapefruit and oh can you give me the blueberries please? I think they're in the fridge. So our collaboration with the VA has been a significant help for us guiding our product direction. Um, we got to interview over a dozen audiologists and innovation specialists across four locations. That's Pittsburgh, Palo Alto, Augusta, Orlando, and another location probably snuck in during the process. That's right, Alex. And, and not only did this collaboration have VA staff, but we also assured that we had veteran involvement in the sessions as well. This was really important to have that variety of individuals involved to assure that the feedback that you received was really all encompassing for any end user that might have some sort of interaction with the prototype. So speaking of the feedback, Alex, can you share how that feedback was received and how it impacted your product design and the direction you were going? Yes, the, the biggest piece of feedback we realized or learned from, from people were that we don't have reliable access to Wi-Fi or cell signals. Privacy is a concern if we're thinking about a cloud service because our glasses work on depending on, on accessing a cloud service for the speech recognition. So all of that got us thinking, okay, how do we solve that problem? And so inspired by that, we made a big pivot in our company to embed the speech to text technology into the glasses. So our glasses will always work. You don't have to pair to a phone or go to the cloud. That means it's easier to use. There's no privacy concerns, there's no security concerns, and it's reliable. You could use it anywhere and anytime. That was the biggest contribution. And our next step is once our new prototypes are ready, we're going to actually ship them out to VA clinics and have veterans try them out for themselves to give us even more feedback. And we are super excited. I know all of our VA sites are eagerly awaiting the delivery of those uh, prototypes. One subject matter expert from VA Pittsburgh here actually shared how excited she was to see the prototype in real life and really see this idea come to fruition. I know for me, being a member of this collaboration has really been a super positive experience. It's been great seeing our frontline staff engaged through innovation 
and sharing their passion for serving our veterans just really has been inspiring. I think one of our team members said it best when she stated, I love that the VA is seeking to partner with non-VA innovators so we can bring the, bring the best to our veterans. Thanks for allowing us to share today how we are co-designing innovative solutions to really reimagine veterans healthcare. Thank you. Wow, that was a fantastic story from both of you. Um, I have to admit, I didn't know a lot about this project, so the video was really enlightening to actually see the technology in use. Alex, besides the feedback about needing to connect to the network and having the potential for cell signal loss and so bringing the, the technology into the glasses themselves, what was some of the other early stage feedback you got when you put this idea in front of our veterans here at the VA? What was the reaction that you got from them? I think one of the um, most remarkable pieces of feedback we get is that everybody is different. And so, you know, the questions are, I want to see the captions on top of that, your face. I want to see them next to you. I want to see them to the right of you. I want the font really big because I can read it. I want the font small as possible so I could see more words. So I think everybody has a different idea of, of how they want to use this. And I think that feedback alone is incredibly valued. So, so we know we need to create a device that allows for personalization and customization for everybody. Yeah, and it just goes to highlight the value you get from speaking to your end users and not just assuming what they want or need. Um, that's really terrific. And I'm really excited again with this one too, just to see the next iterations. I think this XR technology, this is a great example of what the XR, the extended reality um, future could look like and how it can really help to augment um, and, and help people with hearing loss to be able to really interact in the world again. Um, I know uh, personally, my dad is a Navy veteran and has pretty significant hearing loss. Um, I know he, I think, likes being novelty able to hear sometimes when my mom will be yelling at him, but I think this is something that I would love to be able to introduce to him as well, because he's not really interested in getting hearing aids, but it would be something that could really help him in social situations, just being able to kind of see and be able to interact a bit faster. So keep up the great work, Alex and Katie. This is exciting and really looking forward to hearing what's next. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank Appreciate you both that. so much. All right, so next up, we are going to hear another story of a collaboration. Um, this one is going to feature Kevin DeMarco and Frank Zitko. Frank is the innovation specialist, or one of two innovation specialists, I should say it correctly, from the Cleveland VA Medical Center. And they are here to talk about their collaboration called Robotic Surgical Tray Assembly System for Sterile Processing. So Kevin and Frank, um, ready when you are to start hearing your story. Thanks, Matt. Uh, as Matt said, my name is Frank Zitko. I'm the Technical Innovation Specialist at the VA Northeast Ohio Healthcare System in Cleveland. Um, and in that role, I'm also a biomedical engineer. Um, I spent the beginning of my career working in the medical device industry. Um, I think most of my engineering colleagues would agree uh, when I say that if I had a nickel for any time, you know, friend or family member said, you know, you're an engineer, right? Uh, you can fix this uh, lawnmower or snowblower or washing machine or insert random household item here. Uh, I'd, I'd probably be pretty well off. Um, and it's really not uncommon for engineers to be handed a list of problems, product specifications, uh, or cost savings initiatives and be told, you know, basically in so many words to figure it out. Um, of course, I say all this partly in jest. After all, our job is to solve problems and it is to create solutions. Um, but in order to solve problems, we need to properly identify them first. Uh, as we've heard many times this week, we need to understand and see firsthand what the user difficulties are, what the gaps are, and what the pain points are. Um, when I first picked up the phone with Kevin, Sergio, and Colin of Riff Robotics, it was refreshing to hear that this is exactly what they wanted and more so needed to do for their business and their future products. Um, they weren't coming in trying to sell a shiny new product or come into our doors with preconceived solutions or ideas. They came in with a blank slate and open mind to solve a true need in sterile processing. Hi, I'm Kevin DeMarco, CEO and co-founder of Riff Robotics. My mom, aunt, and uncle were all nurses throughout their entire careers. One day, my aunt, knowing that I program robots for a living, asked me if, I could, if a robot could prepare instruments for a surgery, since she often had to scramble before surgeries, surgeries to find missing instruments. This question sent us on a journey during which we uncovered the problem of preparing and inspecting surgical instruments, which all hospitals face, but have difficulty performing safely and consistently, 
due, due to a lack of technology and data. After spending some time researching hospitals, how hospitals manage their insulin supply chains, we decided that we need to reach out to healthcare workers if we really wanted to pursue this problem. While doing customer discovery, we were introduced to Frank Zitko, the innovation specialist at the Cleveland, Ohio VA facility, and he told us about the INET greenhouse program. We were excited about this opportunity, so we pitched our idea of seeing how robotics and automation from other sectors, such as manufacturing and warehouse logistics, could be used in a hospital to improve patient outcomes and hospital efficiency. The VA employees were encouraged by our pitch and granted us full access to three of their hospitals. We're extremely grateful to Caitlin Rollins, Julie Whitney, and Frank Zitko for agreeing to work with us as innovation specialists. They were excited about our team and idea, so they invited us to conduct in-person human-centered research at their respective facilities. This collaborative research with the VA allowed us to conduct interviews and passively observe numerous personnel at the three different VA hospitals, where we spent a week each. We interviewed surgeons, OR nurses, sterile processing managers, directors of logistics, and admin personnel. We observed how they performed their daily tasks and gathered as much information as possible. Our research concluded with a list of daily headaches that hospital personnel suffer from and desperately need help with. The one problem that stood out above the rest was the tediousness of inspecting and assembling surgical trays in the hospital's sterile processing departments. We noticed that sterile processing technicians are overwhelmed with the processes given the speed and accuracy that is demanded from them. As a result, mistakes can happen and surgical trays can arrive at the OR with incorrect and missing instruments, which can delay surgeries and potentially increase the risk to patients. As such, we decided to automate the process of inspecting and assembling surgical trays. Our main goal is to aid sterile processing technicians by alleviating the cognitive load required to keep track of the tens of thousands of surgical instruments in hospitals. We're accomplishing this with robotics and computer vision. Technici technicians will be able to tend to multiple trays simultaneously while our product inspects instruments and assembles the trays, guaranteeing their correctness. We have since developed our proof of concept prototype and now we're raising a pre-seed round from investors to develop our go-to-market product. We would not be where we are now without the invaluable help we've received from the VA, the Greenhouse Program, and the innovation specialists that believed in us. If you're interested in following along with our journey, please visit our website at uh, riffrobotics.com. Thanks. Thank you both. That was a great story. Can you tell me a little bit more? What is the next step in the journey for you um, on this uh, wonderful voyage to help bring robotics into this field of sterile processing? Yeah, so where we are right now is, you know, we've been, so my, my co-founders and I, we left our jobs in academia to pursue this problem. And we've been entirely bootstrapping this with our you know, own dime and doing consulting on the side so we can pay our mortgages. Uh, so, and we, so we've been in this deep customer discovery phase for the last year and a half. And just this last fall, we submitted applications to pitch competitions typically to you know, angel investors and pre-seed uh, VC investors. So in fact, last week we were at uh, TechCrunch Disrupt in San Francisco where we spoke to uh, more investors than I've ever spoken to uh, in the period of a week. So now we're, so we have this pre-seed round available, we're raising because you know, while the three of us have the capabilities to design and build these robotic systems, we need some capital in order to get lab space and develop it. And, we're working towards doing some pilot studies in Atlanta, and we also want to do a phase two with the VA. Awesome. Yeah, and how much did the VA process and working through the greenhouse help prepare you for some of these bigger discussions with the, the capital, you know, the, the tech investors to help get you ready for that? I really don't think it would have been possible for us to even start to think about the problem if it weren't for the research we did with the VA. Uh, before that, um, you know, especially, you know, we did this research right after we got vaccinated. So we'd only had internet re research that we had done besides talking to my aunt and my mom. So, you know, we went right from being in our basements for a year and a half to seeing people three weeks in a row at different VAs. Uh, and I, I don't, I don't think we could have even started without the VA research. No, it's fab. It's that's great. And it's great to have it validated too, right? To, ha to have this need in your mind, but to see that it actually does really help to solve a problem that that healthcare workers are having. So thank you both so much for sharing your story. This has been awesome. And again, looking forward to hearing what's next from both of you. Thank you so much. Thank you.
All right, next up, we have one more um, demo here. So we're going to move on to Carrie Cardon and Julie Whitney. They're going to tell us a story about supporting frontline innovation. So hi, Carrie. Hi, Julie. How are you today? Hi, Matt. Thank you so much. Hi. Yeah, awesome. We're, let's get started. I'm excited to hear your story. OK, well, I'm Carrie Cardon. I'm a registered nurse, healthcare architect, innovator and inventor, and today I'm going to share my inventing journey, which led to the INET Greenhouse Program. And hi, I'm Julie, and I'm a nurse also, and I'm a longtime VA employee currently working as an innovation specialist at the North Florida South Georgia Veterans Health System. So my experiences as a former frontline nurse have instilled a passion for designing products that support safe and efficient care processes for nurses and enhance the dignity of our patients. Nurses often spend time on care processes that are inefficient and unsafe. Nurses are experts at the workarounds, which are red flags that something isn't working, and those represent design opportunities. My focus is to take a step back and explore the reasons for the workarounds. Is there a new product or a product redesign that can meet the needs of nurses and eliminate the need for the workarounds? My motivation and my mission is to support nurses caring for patients. More efficient care processes will have the added benefit of improving patient safety and enhancing the, the patient experience. With a dad, relatives, and good friends who are veterans, I'm on a mission to support veterans care and really bring a human-centered experience for nurses and for patients. One of the patient care workarounds I observed is the process around patient trash disposal at the bedside. Sick patients often cannot reach the trash can on the floor, so soil tissues and trash end up on the patient's overbed table and in emesis and bath basins that are being used as de facto trash receptacles. Our patient trash disposal system consists of a simple plastic disposable ring that clips to any location on the patient's overbed table. A cup is dropped into the ring to contain patient trash. When the cup is full, simply remove the cup and replace it without touching the cup's contents. This patient trash disposal system mitigates cross-contamination on the patient's overbed table, helps keep staff hands cleaner, and really supports a lean approach by saving staff time and steps associated with patient trash disposal. A cleaner overbed table promotes patient dignity and enhances the care experience. We've been working closely with INET Greenhouse and their field teams across the US, and we are currently in phase two of an experiential trial. The trash tote was deployed at eight veteran administration healthcare systems throughout the country. It allowed staff, patients, visitors, caregivers to experience the device. Feedback was obtained via a, a variety of mechanisms, including photographs, verbally, both individual one-on-one -on -one interviews, group interviews, collaborative discussions, via paper and electronic survey. Data was also captured on mural and analyzed and aggregated. And on the slide above, which is hard to see, but that's just kind of snapshot of mural showing all the insights and aggregation of data that we were able to collect. We did reach data saturation despite such a geographic span. We were Orlando, Biloxi, Sheridan, Minnesota, Asheville, Pittsburgh, Reno, uh, Reno Nevada, Heinz, Chicago. So really throughout the country, yet we did achieve data saturation in her findings. All that was shared on the electronic workspace to provide direction forward. Yeah. So my inventing journey has really been a very steep learning curve. As a solo inventor from a rural state, I did not always have the support I needed to develop products. Through online research, I learned the process for how to design and prototype products, but a huge piece of the puzzle was missing, the ability to actually trial my products within a healthcare system. That's when I learned about the INET Greenhouse Program. I had the opportunity to pitch my product to the Greenhouse team to see if my product would be a good fit, and I was very fortunate and grateful to be accepted into their program. Inventors can reimagine care processes and products, but without the support of innovation systems such as the INET Greenhouse, we could not bring our product innovations to fruition. We're receiving critical evaluations, and at times it can be challenging to incorporate all those suggestions, but all of the feedback has been essential to the development of a viable product. 
Sometimes it takes a village and we are so very grateful for our INET Greenhouse Village. So thank you, Matt. Thank you, Carrie. Um, that was a great story. Can you talk a little bit more about what it's like as an entrepreneur to bring your idea, your uh -huh. baby in some cases, to a healthcare organization yeah. and get feedback that might not always be aligned with what you're hoping to hear, right? Like what was that like for you and how did you yeah. manage that feedback moving forward? Well, something I've learned as as a, a solo inventor it is really understanding, you know, the, the critical feedback and, and not taking it personally. It's um, it, it's one of those things where it, it's so important to you know get those critical evaluations because it really does help refine the design of that product. And without you know getting that critical feedback, you, you really don't get that that product evaluation that you're going to need. We're really anticipating uh, product launch sometime next year. So you know this is you know these experiential trials for us right now are just so crucial as part of this process for us. Yeah, absolutely. What's next, Carrie, in the in the journey for you and your team? Oh my gosh. Well, what's next is um, we're in phase two of the experiential trial. Once we finish with that portion of the trial, it's going to be going back and really refining the product and then hopefully looking at, you know, gaining funding and then getting some getting a product launch for for next year. Awesome. That's really exciting. Looking forward to it, Carrie. Thank you for and Julie Thank as you, well. Matt. Great to hear from you today. I really loved hearing your story. Thank you. All right, thank you. So we are shifting gears for those watching live one last time. So now we're gonna move on and we're gonna hear stories from employees within the Office of Healthcare Innovation and Learning, which is the larger organizational group under which the Innovators Network lives. Um, so we're gonna hear two of those stories today and then we're gonna circle back around for one last experience um, from an employee innovator. But first, without further ado, we're gonna move over to Stefan Ian Chalev, I'm sorry if I said your name wrong. Um, we are very excited to hear your story. I think Dr. I is the, the going term here, so that's what everyone told me to call you. <laughs> um, we're gonna hear about your program called Anesthesiology and Perioperative Outcome Data Analysis. So let's hear more about that, Dr. I. Well, thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction. And yes, uh, my name is Stephanie Anchulev, and I'm leading the Department of Anesthesiology at the Central Virginia Healthcare System. So uh, anesthesia is a field of, that is very fast evolving. And as such, we want to know how we're doing. What are we actually uh, performing and how are we impacting healthcare? So we want to continuously be able to assess that. How can we improve the care we deliver? And uh, why focus on the anesthesia data system integration? Anesthesia is indelible part of the surgical and non-surgical periprocedural continuum of care. It impacts the screening, surgical preparation of patients, their interprocedural well-being and the road to early recovery and opioid mitigation strategies. Anesthesiologists are present in the operating room, electrophysiology lab, interventional radiology, endoscopy suite, just to name a few. Outside in the anesthesia community, there are two major quality analysis databases. The National Anesthesia Clinical Outcome Registry, or NACOR, housed by the American Quality Institute of the American Society of Anesthesiology, and the Multicenter Perioperative Group, or MPOC, that is housed in Michigan. Both databases are taking slightly different approaches to anesthesia quality assessment. Attempts to join these databases were deemed impossible due to firewall and PHI data exchange constraints in the VA. Thus, we focused on developing and expanding on this concept within the VHA with the help of our healthcare informatics department led by Brady Wright and Charlene Davis. The anesthesia data in the VA turned out is fragmented and not part of a major analysis like the VASQIP and SAIL databases. It is regionally collected and stored. Combining these data bases and being able to provide insight into the anesthesiologist's impact on the perioperative outcomes is particularly important in a time of fast changing healthcare environment and rapid technological advances, particularly throughout the VA. The VHA contains a repository of enormous amount of 
electronic patient data over 30 years worth of it, and does represent a unique opportunity for data analysis and machine learning. With the help of the innovation network, we were able to access the Arches, a synthetic database, and collaborate with the industry to combine the isolated databases and provide an analysis of the veterans journey in the perioperative and periprocedural period. Our efforts will allow for intra and inter facility identification of best anesthesia practices and outcomes. The financial impact of the episodes of care and personal patient experience in the perioperative period. The opportunity of utilizing a synthetic database arches opened completely new dimensions to accelerate the analytic process in a very safe environment. With large amounts of data, utilizing predictive anal analytics, we want to help the anesthesiologists find the best data-driven approach to the individual patient and allow outcome comparisons across organizations inside and outside of the VA. And again, thanks a lot to the Innovation Network and to the Arches environment who allowed us to initiate this project. There is a lot of work before us, but therefore we stay optimistic. So thank you very much for your attention and watching. Thank you very much, Dr. I. That was really interesting to hear about your project. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about your journey um, from becoming um, a doctor, just working at the Richmond VA Medical Center, um, to actually becoming an innovator? Like, how did that journey begin for you? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, the journey began long before I joined the VA. I think there was always a little bit of an incentive somewhere around and like many of my colleagues, we always ask the question, how can we do better? How can we excel? How can we provide the best uh, service to our veterans we, and our patients? Um, so there is always um, this initiative that stands behind us and pushes us forward. At the VA, however, I have to say there is an amazing system. And once I joined, a lot of, um, I, it really opened my eyes to opportunities and being able to connect with the innovation network with very supportive environment and a team within the central virginia healthcare system it has opened new frontiers and here i am uh, with several projects that we have started within the central virginia healthcare system moving forward and looking to collaborate with industry as well as within the ohill environment and innovators network so Thanks everybody for that. It is an amazing journey so far. Yeah, I'm just gonna close by saying, keep up the great work down there in Richmond. You're doing a lot of great things in addition to your project. So where I know we will hear, be hearing a lot more coming out of Richmond in the next few years. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. All right, so moving on, we are moving on to Ho-Chung Gillis, um, talking about the future of GI, artificial intelligence and digital therapeutics. Um, this is a fascinating title and something I am really interested to hear more about. So I'm very excited to shift gears and then hear more about um, this collaborative journey thus far. Thank you. Um... My name is Ho-Chan Gillis, and I'm the program director for GI hepatology and liver transplant. I would first like to thank the Innovation Network for supporting these important collaborations and the opportunity to share our project, Digital Therapeutic Approach with Artificial Intelligence Assisted Point of Care Testing to address the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease epidemic. Um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is the most common cause of chronic liver disease worldwide and it currently affects more than 25% of the global population. It serves as a huge clinical and economic burden for the Veterans Health Administration. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is characterized into non-alcoholic fatty liver, the potentially non-progressive subtype of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And then you have non-alcoholic steohepatitis, which is also called NASH, which is the potentially progressive subtype of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease that can lead to advanced fibrosis, cirrhosis, liver cancer, and hepatic decompensation requiring liver transplantation. Most patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or NASH are seen in a primary care setting. 
Although not all patients with NAFLD or NASH require specialty hepatology care, current inconsistent care processes and failure to identify which patients are at risk or may benefit from specialty care can lead to poor related outcomes. The goal of this collaboration between the Veterans Health Administration Innovation um, uh, um, uh, um, VHAIE, um, the Central Virginia Healthcare System worked with two external partners to develop a pilot program to assess the feasibility of a digital therapeutic intervention for patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. According to the Digital Therapeutic Alliance, digital therapeutic is designed to deliver medical interventions directly to patients using evidence-based, clinically evaluated software to treat, manage, and prevent a broad spectrum of diseases and disorders. The aim of this digital therapeutic platform is to manage, treat, and monitor disease progression for patients with metabolic-related liver disease. We are using a multifaceted digital therapeutic platform to monitor and guide treatment for patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease between their routine scheduled medical appointments. This pilot also uh, includes utilizing a porn care ultrasound technology using artificial intelligence and signal processing design to provide cost-effective, non-invasive assessment of hepatic fibrosis and chronic liver disease. As you can see in uh, my slide, this pilot will have four clinical application groups. The first group is digital therapeutic platform only. Then we combine that platform with meal support. And the third group is the digital therapeutic with hypnosis. And then the fourth group is uh, all of the interventions, including digital therapeutic with meal support and hypnosis. This will permit the clinical evaluation of health-related outcomes depending on the application group. The pilot will assess the feasibility and acceptance and adherence to digital therapeutic application among veterans with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Lastly, this collaboration will inform the digital therapeutic platform algorithm, care pathways for optimal um, integration of digital therapeutics, guide specific interventions, and long-term, and help hopefully define the long-term economic health impact of this disease. And that's all I have. Thank you. This is really interesting, I'm not gonna lie. I've been sitting here the whole time listening to your story, <laughs> just kind of shaking my head and nodding and being wowed by what you've been presenting. So what was the initial reaction when you put the idea of using digital therapeutics in front of veterans when kind of getting to the point of developing um, and planning for your pilot? So I think there is a huge uptake in technology, and I think we learned a lot from the COVID epidemic, you know, the pandemic, um, because um, before there are a lot of barriers, you know, Wi-Fi, you know, broadband, and many, and also just the uptake in, you know, our aging veteran population. And I think that, you know, there is, you're starting to see a slow uptake. We're having a lot of innovative programs. We already have remote monitoring like My Healthy Buddy. We have other platforms like there, there's gonna be iPad um, integration so that we can reach, you know, uh, expand our reach and remote monitoring. Um, so I, I think that, you know, in non-veteran populations, you know, they're, you know, we use apps all the time, you know, um, and I think that it's how we can strategically implement and use this application in the veterans and how and what we can learn from it, because, you know, we still need to learn about feasibility adoption, but also, you know, using um, digital therapeutics with other platforms platforms considering that there are no therapeutic options that are approved by the FDA for the treatment of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. It's a very complex, you know, disease state has multiple, you know, many facets of, you know, why people um, are obese and have metabolic liver disease. And I think that, you know, we have a lot to learn from this pilot so that we can really strategically implement the use and what type of digital therapeutics in this disease state. Yeah, I would say, and this is coming not a moment too soon because this isn't non-alcoholic um, liver disease. It's one of the, mo the fastest growing diagnoses amongst both veterans and non-veterans. Am I wrong? <laughs> Absolutely. And, yeah. and we can learn and hopefully uh, apply this to other health systems as well. Absolutely. This is um, very well needed, very timely. And um, the pilot, too, just hearing how you're doing the four different arms to kind of test out each individual piece and then test them all together. I'm really, really interested to follow this one along and kind of hear what's next for you. So thank you again so much for taking the time today to share your story with us. Thank you. 
Fantastic, thank you. All right, and so last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Jared Rieswarber, who's here to bring us back around. So Jared is here making sure we could accommodate his schedule today. Um, Jared is a, a man of many jobs and many um, vocations. He's been doing a lot, and I know he's been running around, so we put him in right here at the end to make sure we could hear his important story. So Jared is here to tell us about his program called Multi-Site Dissemination of a Virtual Reality Treatment for a substance use, substance use disorder. So Dr. Jared, without further ado, the floor is yours. Uh, first off, I think I take the cake for the longest title. So that's <laughs> something. Um, yep, thank but, you for the um, mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm a clinical psychologist in the Central Virginia healthcare system. And I'm gonna talk to you today about a virtual reality platform that can be used to treat substance use disorders. So if you're like me, you know a loved one uh, who has struggled with substance use disorders. My uncle died by suicide while in active addiction. And like my uncle, that person you thought of may not have gotten the care they needed. Juxtapose that to right now, where after five awards from the Innovation Network, we built really effective care called Transcending Self Therapy, an integrative cognitive behavioral therapy. And through multiple funding rounds from the Innovation Network, support from people like, um, Ann Bailey, Caitlin Rollins, Allison Emerhang, and all of the VHA ecosystem, and lots of hard work, we develop some really great protocols, namely transcending self therapy. It's an integrative cognitive behavioral therapy that was shown to decrease substance misuse after treatment, decrease depression, improve quality of life scores, and save VA hospitals money, increasing access and making the programs that we have more available to patients. So we were doing great, improving care, researching, and then COVID hit. Treatment options for patients with substance use disorders were trimmed back or disappeared. Substance abuse and overdoses unfortunately spiked. Social isolation increased and basic things like check, checking therapy homework for therapists like myself became impossible. Cue slide. And in the spirit of the innovation ecosystem, we pivoted to adjust to the new landscape and worked with the aforementioned people and virtual reality firm called Concio to build a virtual reality platform and address these problems. The VR platform is based on uh, transcending self therapy and it brings our veterans into a totally immersible world where they can put on a headset, begin on a canoe, arrive at a cabin and learn cognitive behavioral techniques while learning concepts like deep breathing, grounding, or other proven strategies to improve well-being. The, the VR platform is not meant to replace therapy. Conversely, it acts as their homework or out-of-session practice. This is important as homework compliance is associated with better treatment outcomes. And it's just like if you went to a trainer and she had you work on your tennis swing. If you only did it during the session and did not practice it, you wouldn't get nearly as good as if you practice it between sessions. Same for therapy homework. It turns out the hour of the therapist times when we use VR can be as much as five hours and we are piloting it across the country and it's going really well. Veterans are finding it useful, recommending it to others and it's so important to their recovery. This has been in done in large part to the innovation network and I believe it could be one of the biggest advancements in psychotherapy for substance abuse in decades. Thank you to the network and thank you to the audience members for hearing this story. Thank you, Jared. Um, I would like to just ask, you said something at the beginning and I wanted to just call on this. I've asked someone before about this as well. I think you said five grants through the Innovation Network. So you've, you've been working on this for five years. Tell me a bit more about the perseverance it took to get you to the point where you're at today. I wouldn't say perseverance. I would say it's opportunities for creative thinking. I was talking to Dr. Ho-Chun Gillis right before and we were talking about uh, uh, some issues we're having uh, that are coming with the changing landscape uh, in our world, in the patients that are coming to us. And because we have the innovation network, we're right away we were like, hey, we should apply for another innovation uh, grant next cycle. Let's try and do this. Instead of shying away from the problems, we're leaning into the problems, saying that you know the VA is not going to be part of you know, the movement in healthcare, we want to be leading the, the movement in healthcare. And I think the innovation network, the people that are working in it 
uh, what are creating this place that's conducive to thoughtful discourse between providers like Dr. Ho Chang Gillis and myself, which just happened, you know, literally minutes ago, is that now we know if we have a problem, we can find a solution and we'll get supported for it. Yeah, and you're right. I mean, we in the Innovators Network create the environment, but it still takes the staff like yourself to have the willingness to speak up when they see the problems and being able to do something about it. So we, we definitely appreciate you and everyone who's gone today to share their, their journey and their experience. It's been amazing to hear. Thank you. And, and I do think it, it creates kind of a fun atmosphere. Um, and I do hope more people in the VA learn about it because it's fun when you get to go to work and know that if there is a problem, you're going to get the support to try and solve it. And the problem doesn't have to continue to exist. And we can keep pushing forward to advance care, not only at the VA, but worldwide. You actually just ended more perfectly than I think I even could have, Jared. So I appreciate that. <laughs> Um, that was amazing. Thank you so much for cueing me right into the end here. So thank you again for sharing your story with us today. Good to be here. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everyone. So that is a wrap. Um, that is it for the, the day three of the innovation stories here from IEX. So I know we have one more live event coming up in the next few minutes with our Shark Tank. Um, definitely encourage you to hop over and join that feed and watch the, the Shark Tank event take place. It's something that I definitely enjoy having been part of for the past few years. Um, we've heard some amazing stories today and I would just say to anyone out there, especially if you are a VA employee and you have an idea, um, look for us, look for the Innovators Network, look for our programming, and even if you're working in the private industry, right, find a way to solve that, to work on that problem, identify it, and find someone who will help support you through the journey. It is definitely worth it to help push healthcare forward into the future. So again, signing off here from the National Press Club, thank you all for tuning in today. We really appreciated hearing all of these great stories throughout the course of three days, and we look forward to hearing from you again soon.